between the park tickets, the hotel rooms, the food, the travel, the other miscellaneous costs. Budgeting for your dream Disney World vacation is overwhelming, but I've got good news. We've already done all the number crunching for you today on DFV Guide. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Vlog. Now, I know that a big concern when planning a Disney World vacation is figuring out a reasonable budget. Today, the DFB team and I have come up with not just one type of Disney vacation budget, but several types of budgets for lots of different travel groups to help you find a springboard for when it comes to how much you should be saving, as well as how much you should roughly expect to spend while you're there. Keep in mind that every family and group is unique, so what works for one group may not quite work for you. Hopefully, even if your group looks totally different from some of the examples we've listed here today, you'll still be able to visualize how much a vacation to the most magical place on earth is actually gonna cost you. Also, just so we have one consistent variable to lean on, I'll be looking at prices for tickets and hotels that are currently listed in the month of June, 2025. Prices are not only subject to change, but may look a whole lot different if you decide to visit during a cheaper non-peak season, like August or September, or during a busier peak season, like around the holidays. Okay, we're starting for the family with kiddos. It's time to take little Sally, age four, and little Timmy, age eight, on their very first Disney World trip. Good for you. So parents, what's a trip for a family of four, two adults, two kids, reasonably gonna cost? Let's start by looking at our hotel options. Disney's value resorts are gonna be your more affordable choice when it comes to choosing a Disney resort, which is great because the value hotels tend to be the most colorful and character oriented, which means your younger kids are gonna love them. The absolute cheapest room option you're gonna find across all the Disney World Resorts will be over at Disney's All-Star Sports. A standard room here will cost you around $191 per night. Yep, that's the cheapest price room for that June 2025 time frame, but don't worry, we'll explore a few more affordable alternatives later on too. Again, if you book a room during Disney's down season, this price will drop, but no matter when you book this room, you'll still have access to the 2025 Disney Resort benefits, like early theme park entry, which allows you to enter any of the parks on any date, 30 minutes before they open for everyone else, and that free water park visit on your check-in day. The other all-star resorts, movies and music, tend to be around the same price point, except if you choose the all-star music family suites. Not only is this suite type the cheapest suite on property, but it's also got so much space to spread out. We're talking a living room with two Murphy beds, two full bathrooms, a kitchen space, and a master bedroom with a door you can close, all for around $434 per night. It is a great deal. Disney's Art of Animation Resort also has family suites with different Disney animated movie themes featuring Cars and The Lion King and Finding Nemo. But these suites are more expensive than the all-star music ones. The Lion King family suite, which can comfortably sleep up to six guests, is going to cost you around $587 per night. Art of Animation also has standard Little Mermaid themed room options. Those are not suites and those are priced at $289 per night. But that cut cost will also cut out a lot of the roominess you receive at the suites. One of the best reasons to stay at Art of Animation is that it sits directly on the sky Skyliner route, which is going to give you an easygoing sky gondola trip over to Epcot, Disney's Hollywood Studios, and the other Skyliner area resorts like Disney's Riviera and Caribbean Beach. But the cheapest resort on the Skyliner route is actually Disney's Pop Century Resort. You can get a preferred room here, which will put you much closer to the Skyliner station or the resort's lobby for around $267 per night. But for the sake of this hypothetical budget, we're going to stick with the cheapest option, the All-Star Sports one. If I book a room for June 16th to June 22nd as a vacation package, which bundles the price of my hotel and standard one park per day tickets for each member of my family, I'm looking at a total so far of $4,238. That sounds like a lot of money to drop all at once, especially when you've got a household of four mouths to feed. Fortunately, you don't have to pay that all at once. If you plan out your trip far enough in advance, you'll only initially have to worry about paying the $200 deposit. Then Disney gives you the freedom to pay off the rest of your vacation package via the website or the My Disney Experience app in a way that you feel the most comfortable with. So you could pay off big chunks at a time or you could pay it off little by little, just as long as you have the entire amount paid off 30 days before your arrival date. Now keep in mind that you may not wanna do the vacation package bundle if you wanna pay for fewer ticket days or if there's currently a promotion on Disney's special offers, deals and discounts page that allows you to save money on hotels or tickets, but not as a bundled cost. Now when you proceed to check out, you'll also have the option to add on one of Disney's 
Disney's dining plans. Essentially, a Disney dining plan allows you to prepay for your Disney meals before your trip, so you don't have to worry about paying for them during your trip. Though, if you're gonna be eating at a table service restaurant, you'll still need to tip your server at the end of your meal. This plan may not be for everyone, and if you wanna look more into it, I'd highly suggest watching some of our past Disney dining plan videos so you can see all the different pros and cons listed out, because there are a lot of them. But again, for the sake of this example, I'll go ahead and have our proverbial family of four add the quick service dining plan to their budget. This brings our total up to $5,244. All right, now we got to factor in how we're actually going to get little Sally and little Timmy over to the Disney bubble in the first place. Depending on where you live, it can be cheaper to drive to Disney World than it would cost to fly, especially if you have a larger family you're toting along with you. That being said, gas prices, which are averaging around the $3 per gallon range in Florida right now, and nights spent at a hotel along the way, which can be $100 to $200 per night, may end up canceling out those savings. The good news is that because you're staying at a Disney-owned property, you won't have to worry about paying extra for parking if you decide to drive to the parks instead of relying on Disney's complimentary transportation. Otherwise, you'd have to factor in an extra 30 bucks per day each time you park at the theme parks. So while this travel budget is definitely loose and depends on what gas prices look like in the states that you'll be traveling through, plus how many hotels you might have to stay at along the way, I'm going to say it might be a good idea to budget around $500 for travel costs. This brings our overall total to $5,744. Now it's time for us to decide on multi-pass or single pass. Much like Disney Dining Plan, purchasing lightning lanes isn't necessary and you definitely won't have to have them to ride the rides, but they do help you bypass those lanes the standby queues in exchange for much shorter lines. And when you got younger kids in tow, that can be a major lifesaver. So we'll go ahead and purchase four days worth of multi-passes and skip the single passes for now. Much like hotel and ticket prices, multi-pass prices do fluctuate based on the time of year and the park you want to visit, but we typically see them land between the $15 and $39 price point. Just to be on the safe side, because you don't want to under budget, I'm going to make things easy on us and say that we're paying for this trip $30 per day per person. Though again, depending depending on the park, that may be way more than you need to worry about. This means little Sally and little Timmy's family will be paying around $480 for that multi-pass privilege for four park days. So that's gonna put our total up to $6,224. Finally, we can't forget about the souvenirs little Sally and little Timmy are gonna pick out when they're there. And don't worry, parents and guardians, we'll budget in something real nice for you to take home too. And just to be on the safe side, I'm gonna set aside $50 per family member, though you may very well spend less than that or more than that, depending on what treasures you find. So that adds another $200 to our budget. By the way, you may wanna purchase Disney souvenirs ahead of your trip for the little ones from like Amazon or your dollar store or even the Disney Store website if they're running a big sale. That way you can still provide your kids with a memento from their time at the parks without paying like 40 bucks for a pair of mini ears that you know they'll never wear again. With the extra 200 bucks, that brings our total to $6,424. But I'm gonna go ahead and add that $200 safety net into that total just to factor in those extra costs that'll spring up on you, like emergency necessities, toll roads, etc. Which brings the grand vacation total for this family of four to $6,624. $624. Now, how about the adults only group weekend? All right, let's shift our thinking from a kid focused Disney World getaway to an adults only friend group celebration. For this budget, we're going to cut down our trip from that June 16 to June 22nd timeline that we were using before and keep it to a weekend getaway between June 20th and June 23rd. That way we can accommodate everyone's work schedules and vacation time. We're also gonna focus on paying for one individual person instead of what it's gonna cost the whole group since if a similar hypothetical situation happens to you, you're more than likely only gonna need to worry about paying for you, not everybody else. Now, there are quite a few ways you can go about lodging, but if you got a bigger group with you that's all wanting to crash together in the same space, your best option on Disney property is to go with one of the more spacious Disney vacations vacation club villas. DVC villas give you furnishings that are generally a bit more on the higher end. You'll also get larger square footage in some of these rooms when compared to Disney's other standard hotel rooms. Plus, special amenities can make your trip easier and more convenient. In DVC villas with one to two bedrooms, you're going to find full kitchens, in-room laundry, a large living room, and a dining area. Most DVC rental prices that you book directly through the Disney website will cost between $780 and $2,000 per night, depending on where you stay and what time of year you're there. 
But you don't have to be a DVC member to stay in these rooms. Non-DVC members can book rooms straight through Disney like you'd do a standard hotel room, or you can rent points from a DVC member to save a little money. When we decide to go the villa route and rent points instead of buy them directly through Disney, we like to use David's DVC rental site to make sure there's a professional third-party middleman between the renter and the rentee, ensuring that both sides of the deal can benefit from the purchase with no takesy backsies. However, for this budgeting scenario, I'm actually gonna go a cheaper route for everyone and say that maybe, just maybe, staying off property is gonna be the best way to go instead. If you have more than five or six people in your group, it might be difficult to find budget-friendly accommodations at Disney World. However, with an Airbnb or a Verbo, you could get a house or apartment with multiple bedrooms and a shared living space. Everyone could even get a separate bathroom. Imagine it. Airbnbs near Disney property tend to cost around $150 to $500 per night, depending on what type of rental you choose. So I'm going to aim down the middle here and say that our proverbial Airbnb is going to cost $250 per night or about $1,000 total. If you're splitting this cost with a group of five adults, I'm claiming five so that the math is easier, then that means you'll have to pitch in about $200 to cover your part of the rental. Quick note though, Airbnb life isn't for everyone. It takes longer to get to the parks and you're going to miss out on those extra Disney resort perks so do some investigating before you book. Also keep in mind that lots of these rentals charge extra fees and require guests to do some cleaning tasks before you check out, so there are definitely pros and cons to consider. You'll want to really pay attention to the listing specifics and the online reviews so that you aren't taken off guard by what your group agrees to rent. Because you won't have Disney's complimentary hotel transportation at your disposal if you are in an Airbnb, you'll need to factor in driving or renting a ride share into your total cost each day. Remember, parking at the theme parks is going to set you back $30 per day, depending on when you book a ride share as well as how far your Airbnb is located from your destination. There's a good chance you'll have to pay more than $30, especially considering you'll need a ride back to your Airbnb at the end of the night, and you might have to book more than one ride share to accommodate everyone in your group. So we're just going to say be prepared to pay about $60 for parking or transportation, which means you'll need to pitch in about $12 per day. We got to pay for park tickets separately this time since we're not going the vacation package route, but because we only have about two days to explore as much of the parks as possible, we're going to go ahead and splurge on park hoppers to give us the ability to jump between parks all weekend long. A park hopper two-day ticket for one person on that June weekend is going to cost about $423. We're also not going to be Disney Dining Plan eligible since, again, we won't be booking a vacation package, so we're going to have to pay for all our theme park food out of pocket. Y'all have a lot of ground to cover during your weekend getaway, so you may want to focus on quick service meals for lunch and dinner, and maybe pack some Pop-Tarts or protein bars in your park bag before your trip so you can save yourself from the breakfast expense. Quick service prices vary, but if you want to just focus on getting food and skip the cost of a soda so you can rely on your emotional support water bottle to keep you hydrated, I'd say that'll be roughly $15 per meal. You can make that even cheaper if you decide to order kids' meals instead, which will cut down that price by half and still give you a decent portion of food. But We'll stick with the adult size portions for now, budgeting your total for theme park food to about $60. And maybe a little bit more, cause don't forget about the fun celebratory cocktails. If you wanna budget back for at least two alcoholic beverages each day, that's gonna more than double the cost of your food, bringing your dining total to about $130. Again, you can always cut out that expense if you wanna order a couple of mocktails instead of for something fun and fruity, but a whole lot less expensive. So this currently brings our total to about $765. Now we gotta talk travel expenses. Flying to Disney World can be cheaper and more convenient for your group. Usually it'll get you there faster and you'll be able to skip over the extra cost of hotel stays during your travels. Unless, of course, there's some sort of flight delay or cancellation, which could happen, especially around busier and stormier times of the year. Keep in mind that flight prices change daily and there are so many flights and airlines out there for you to choose from, so it's always a good idea to do your own research. Compare different airlines and airport prices. Maybe you've got some airline miles you can use. So I can't cover all the flight price possibilities you're going to run into. It'd take me forever and be really boring, but since we've seen Orlando flights be as cheap as $50 per person for Spirit Airlines when flying out of Atlanta, or as expensive as $500 per person for Frontier when flying out of San Francisco, I'm going to once again aim for the middle here and say we're going to budget about $250 per flight round trip for this scenario. This pushes our total to $1,015. Okay, to Lightning Lane or not to Lightning Lane, that is the question. Let's go ahead and skip the multi-pass 
pass cost this time because your group might not be stressing about hitting up as many rides as possible, but prioritizing a few of their must-dos. So we'll budget back for a few single passes instead, including one for Flight of Passage in Animal Kingdom, about 16 bucks per person, Rise of the Resistance in Hollywood Studios, about $25 per person, Guardians of the Galaxy, Cosmic Rewind in Epcot, that's about $17 per person, and Tron Light Cycle Run in Magic Kingdom, which is about $20 per person. This brings you to a total of $78. Note that single pass lightning lane prices are subject to change. You can hold up to two single pass lightning lanes per park day. Want to learn more about multi passes and single passes to see if either or both are a good fit for your trip? We got a free guide that'll help you out. Just scan the QR code you see on the screen now or head to disneyfoodblog.com slash multi pass after this. Believe me, I know that this is not something you want to spend time to figure out, so we've got it sorted out for you. And just like before, I'm also going to give you a $50 budget for merchandise, but you might want to bump that up to like $130 if you want a spirit jersey and mini ears combo. So for this fun-filled weekend getaway with your friends with a $200 safety net included, again, for potential unexpected costs, you're looking at a total price for you and you only at about $1,143. So honeymooning at Disney World can be a bit tricky, not because of a lack of things to do, but because you might be trying to find that balance of doing something classy while also staying within a reasonable budget for a brand new family who's just starting their lives together. I was just talking last week to one of our viewers, Victoria. She and her fiance were getting married and they were going to Disney World and going to Disney Cruise and all kinds of cool stuff. But they were like, what do we do when we go to Disney World? What do we do to celebrate? So Disney's moderate resorts can offer mid-level amenities at mid-level prices, sort of like the Goldilocks of Disney World hotels. Some of the cheapest moderate resort rooms can be found at Disney's Port Orleans French Quarter and Riverside, just a boat ride away from the Disney Springs Shopping District. A standard French Quarter room between June 16th and 22nd, again, that's going to cost you around $302 per night. That's right, a standard room here is only a little bit more than a standard room at Art of Animation. And you'll be within walking distance to beignets when you stay here. Can't put a price on that. Now, if you want to get a little fancy and embrace your inner prince or princess, the Riverside Resort has royal guest rooms available for you to book. These are Disney royalty themed with photos of Disney princesses on the wall and touches from their movies scattered throughout the room's decor. One of our favorite touches, those headboards light up with fireworks. That's fantastic. And I also love the Aladdin's lamp water faucets in the bathrooms. Those are pretty cool too. Anyway, royal guest rooms are priced around $393 per night. Jumping back over to the Skyliner Resorts again, Disney's Caribbean Beach has standard rooms for around 305, though you may not be thrilled with how long it'll take you to walk everywhere around that hotel. This place is sprawling, but you do have Skyliner, don't forget. Now let's look at a moderate resort with some major deluxe features. Disney's Coronado Springs houses the Grand Destino Tower with upscale food options, rooftop views, elegant rooms and suites. And for a standard room in Grand Destino with a view out across the water, prices average around $421. Grand Destino is also the only moderate resort that offers a deluxe sweet stay with club level access. That means that guests staying in these rooms have access to the resort's Kronos Club, which is an exclusive relaxing space that serves complimentary refreshments for breakfast, snacks, drinks, and desserts throughout the day. But just because Grand Destino is a moderate resort doesn't mean the club level rooms are going to be a steal of a deal. You'll still have to pay around $637 plus per night to stay in them. And despite paying that high price, you're still not going to have the extended evening hours benefits, which are offered to deluxe resort guests only and give you the chance to stay in select parks on certain nights up to two hours after the park closes for the general public. So you don't get that at Grand Destino, even though if you're staying in a club level room, you're paying over $600 a night. Now, if you want a much cheaper Coronado Springs room option, step outside the tower and check out the casitas around the older section of the resort. A preferred room in this area is gonna cost you about $283 per night. You might also wanna go with a non-Disney owned property and book a room over at the Walt Disney World Swan and Dolphin Hotels and the Swan Resort. Reserve. This is where you're going to still receive those major deluxe perks, like those extended evening hours, at a more moderate price point. These Marriott Bonvoy owned hotels will not only give you the early theme park entry, but also extended evening hour benefits. There's fabulous restaurants here, and you just really feel like you're staying at a deluxe resort. Plus, you'll be within walking distance to Hollywood Studios and Epcot. Now, the Dolphin side of the hotel has room prices ranging in $530 to $1,000. Swan is $560 to $1,000, and the Swan reserve $300 to $1,000. If you see prices running higher than you'd like them to be for any of these rooms during your upcoming stay, you can always knock down those prices.
price tags by using your Marriott reward points to save major bucks if you're a Bonvoy member. And you can also always look for discounts and deals. Okay, so let's stick with the Grand Destino standard room option for now at $4.21 per night. In our little hypothetical, how much is it gonna cost us to go to Disney World? We won't do a vacation package this time since you may wanna spend some of your days just chilling at the pool or hanging around Disney Springs or maybe even driving outside of Orlando to one of Florida's beaches for the day. So total cost for just our hotel room from the 16th to the 22nd is gonna put us back around $2,736. Now let's add three days worth of park tickets to that cost with one park per day, which will come to a total of 972. Yep, I know I'm leaving out one of the parks. Again, just considering how you might want to focus on other Floridian touristy things while you're already down there, you'll just have to discuss it with your honey to settle on an itinerary that works best for both of you. Now, when it comes to travel, I'm going to keep things brief. We'll just assume that the $250 round trip flight I brought up during the adult group weekend itinerary still applies here, so we'll double that price to 500 bucks to accommodate you and your partner. That brings our trip cost currently to $4,200. $8. For food, again, you're probably going to want to focus mostly on quick services to cut down dining costs. But since this is your honeymoon, after all, you might also want to throw in maybe two nicer signature dining options for a romantic dinner date night. Perhaps something like La Cellier in Epcot or Hollywood Brown Derby in Hollywood Studios, maybe Toledo at Grand Destino or Morimoto Asia at Disney Springs. So if that's the case, I'd consider saving around $650 for meals alone. I think we'll skip over the multi-passes and single passes this time, but I'd still save an extra hundred bucks or so for souvenirs to remember your honeymoon by. You might also want to save money to try out a unique premium activity offered at one of the resorts. Since you're staying at Coronado Springs, Sangria University could be a very nice addition to your vacation. Here you'll learn how to make the four different types of sangrias that are served at Three Bridges Bar and Grill, as well as sample them yourself. This costs $79 per person, so we'll add another $158 to your extra experiences fund. After we add that $200 safety net, you're looking at a grand vacation vacation total of $5,316. Now, how about the trip for new parents? Yes, I've been there. Bringing your baby to Disney World is gonna be a much different experience than bringing your kid to Disney World, and that means your budget's gonna look different too. Much like the adults-only travel group, I think we're just gonna take a shorter getaway for now so you can test the waters with your little one and see how they do when they're in a place they're unfamiliar with, or more likely how you do when you're in a place with your kid who's unfamiliar with it. <laughs> but instead of making it Friday to Monday, we're gonna make it Friday to Tuesday instead give you a little more wiggle room with your planning. Remember, you're still gonna wanna stick to somewhat of a routine while you're in the parks with your kiddo. That means sticking to a familiar feeding schedule, nap times, bath routine, etc. Whatever you do at home, try to keep doing it to a certain extent when you're in the Disney bubble to help keep your kiddo from getting ultra cranky when navigating the park for hours at a time. Also, don't forget to use the free baby care centers inside each of the parks if you and your kid need out of the sun for a minute to slip in a feeding or a diaper change or even a quick breather in the AC. It's totally okay to use your baby as an excuse to go get some AC. <laughs> okay, back to budgeting. For some parents, splurging on a hotel room that keeps you within walking distance to the park, like for instance, staying at one of the monorail resorts that's only steps away from the Magic Kingdom, might prove a worthy investment. That way you can step in and out of the parks whenever you need to if your kiddo needs a nap or to cool down back at the hotel. But even those standard monorail resort rooms for the contemporary Polynesian Village and Grand Floridian are going to set you back. $600 to $800 plus per night. So I think for this hypothetical scenario, we're going to save that money and invest in an Airbnb instead. That way you'll have a lot of room to spread out. And when baby wakes up fussy in the middle of the night, you don't have to stress over your hotel neighbors hearing your midnight woes through those thin room walls. We'll drop down the Airbnb cost just a tad since you've got fewer people in your group to accommodate. So let's find a place for around $200 per night or $1,000 total. Nope, not splitting the cost this time. That price is all on you. Okay, ready for some good news though. Babies who are under three years old can visit any of the parks for free, so we don't have to worry about buying park tickets for your newest family member just yet. Now, if you and your partner are purchasing three-day tickets for one park per day, you'll just be paying for the two of you, which will average around the same price as the honeymooning couple from before, $972. When it comes to travel, we'll stick with driving this time around. That way, if you need to pull over for more frequent breaks, or if you're like me and have to stop in the middle of Mississippi somewhere to warm up up a bottle, you'll be able to do so at your own speed. By the way, you haven't lived until you've used a breast pump on the highway. Don't worry, I wasn't driving. Not that time anyway. 
Now, we'll go ahead and make those driving travel costs the same as before, about 500 bucks. We'll also wanna tack on that cost for parking in the theme park lots each day. And since we're planning on going for three park days, that's gonna put us back an extra $90. So we're currently sitting pretty at 2,562. Now we gotta plan for food. Again, this probably won't look too terribly different from the Honeymooners dining budget. More than likely, you'll pack some extra snacks and baby food for your little one to munch on when it's meal time. Just make sure the baby food you bring for your little one is kept in a plastic container, ideally instead of a glass one. Glass containers are not allowed inside the parks, though baby food is sometimes an exception. You don't want to take any risks. Now, if baby's old enough, they might want to eat off your plate. Two meals, one price. In fact, if you decide to book a couple of your meals at one of the character dining buffets so your kid can get a cute picture with Mickey Mouse or Winnie the Pooh, all babies under three years old will also be able to dine here for free. Because really, your kid's not going to make much of a dent in those buffet table portions. A few solid character buffet options you might want to consider for your little family include Chef Mickey's at the Contemporary Resort, Crystal Palace at Magic Kingdom, 1900 Park Fair at Grand Floridian, and Tusker House at Animal Kingdom. Now, I know that this whole situation is for two parents and a baby kind of thing, but if you happen to be visiting Disney with just you and your little one, I've done a lot of single parent trips with my son, no other grown-ups then buffets can be kind of hard, especially if you have a baby baby or a two-year-old and you're dragging them around and they're getting in everybody's way and that can be just a real hassle at buffets. So in that case, and because you know that this is DFB Guide, and of course I have to talk about this restaurant in every single video, go to Garden Grill in Epcot or another family style character meal. It'd be a great option to choose instead of that buffet because not only are you and your kid making memories, meeting lots of characters, but you also don't have to get up from your table to head over to the buffet line, which can be really, really hard when you've got to hold on to like 15 things and a kid. So another important thing I got to mention here real quick is that Disney's table service restaurants have a no stroller policy since the aisles need to be kept clear for the safety of cast members and characters and other diners. So there will be a place to park your stroller right outside the restaurant, but note that baby is either going to have to use a high chair throughout the meal, which the restaurant will provide, or they're going to have to sit on your lap. So this is something that actually, despite all of my trips to Disney World, I did not realize. And there's lots of attractions that your stroller can't go into either. So just be prepared for that. I love a little hip seat. Those were just coming out when I had my kid that you could strap it around your waist and there's a little seat that your kid can sit on so you're not holding all of their weight. So that's a nice one for attractions or for waiting in lines and stuff like that. But also, you know, just be aware that if you go into a restaurant, you're usually not gonna bring that stroller in. So if baby's napping or whatever, it could be a super hassle because you have to wake them up. Just a heads up on that, just so you know. We'll budget back about 500 bucks for meals for you and your partner, though you may be able to cut down on that price if you decide one evening that you'd rather eat at, say the McDonald's or Del Taco or wherever you're staying instead of sitting down for a nice meal inside the park, especially if baby's ready to call it a day. You can cancel dining reservations right up to two hours before your reservation window without getting penalized. But if you forget to cancel before that cutoff time, then you're going to have to pay a no-show fee. That's typically $10 per person, though it could wind up being a whole lot more than that depending on the restaurant. You can find more details about Disney cancellation policies on the Disney World website. Again, we're going to skip the multi and single pass costs this time since baby's probably not tall enough to do a lot of those height requirement rides anyway, but per usual, I'm going to set aside some merchandise money for y'all. Let's set back about $100 plus $28 more so we can give your kid their first haircut over at the Harmony Barbershop in Magic Kingdom, which also comes with a commemorative Mickey hat, a keepsake lock of hair, and an official milestone certificate. By the way, the hair is your child hair. It's not some other kid's hair. Just add that $200 bumper to it all because you never know when you might need to pick up more diapers and formula, etc. on the fly, and your grand total comes to $3,390. Now, I'm going to tell you honestly that when you're traveling with a baby, sometimes it's easier to just throw money at a problem and get it fixed. And so I would probably add an extra 200 bucks just for any of those situations where you just need to get out of there fast and figure it out. That was my experience when I had a baby. And maybe others of you can comment in, uh, in the comments below about your experiences. But there are times when you just are at your wits end and and you just need to get a ride share or something. <laughs> especially if you're staying at an Airbnb that you might need to get back quickly. And if you have your car parked and that's going to be easier to do, but if you are depending on ride shares and stuff, you might take more than you expected. 
Okay, so budgeting for a big trip like this can feel mighty intimidating when you see all the different costs you've got to consider all laid out at once. That being said, there are ways for you to start saving before you step foot inside Disney World. Tip number one, look for discounts. Typically, Disney offers room discounts for many dates throughout the year, but the best way to keep up with those is to subscribe to our free Disney Food Blog newsletter. We're going to send you all the latest deals info directly to your inbox. Savings tip number two, travel on the weekdays instead of the weekends. This strategy isn't always foolproof, but it can be a great way to find major surge price decreases without strictly having to travel during a specific non-peak season that isn't meshing with your schedule. Prices for hotels, tickets, multi-pass, even certain flights can dip during the weekdays, but because weekends tend to be an easier time for people to get out there and vacation, that's when you'll usually see the parks getting more crowded and more expensive. Tuesday to Thursday pricing is normally cheaper than what you'll find on Friday Fridays to Sundays, and Monday's kind of an oddball day. Prices can be cheaper, but they can also spike for airfare since the start of the work week is a more popular time for business travelers to book flights. Savings tip number three, reach out to a travel agent. Tracking down discounts to make sure you're always getting the best deals on your vacation can be exhausting, but you don't have to take on all that responsibility yourself. Our travel agent friends at Small World Vacations will actively seek out Disney World discounts for you and work alongside you to develop a budget that's going to work best for you and your group. Their services are free. We'll make it even easier for you. Just click on the link down below to get a free quote from them. No commitment required. All right, friends, now it's time for you to start working on your own Disney budget. Keep checking back with us as we continue to find new ways to save and uncover new enchanting extras that you may want to squeeze into your future itineraries. And let us know in the comments, where have you saved money? What are your little tips and tricks that you've figured out can save you 10 bucks, 50 bucks, 100 bucks here and there because it all adds up, believe me. And don't forget to pick up your free lightning lane guide over at disneyfoodblog.com slash multipass. This is super, super useful. I know that it's a confusing system. So having that lightning lane guide just totally for free, by the way, it doesn't cost you anything. Then you kind of have your game plan all set and you're ready to go when you need to book those lightning lanes. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. And thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.